The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It is what so many people have been waiting for. Tens of thousands, apparently. An alert system that lets you know when COVID-19 vaccines are available in San Antonio. And the city's unveiled a new text alert system that shows you which local providers have vaccines. But that system doesn't include every place that's offering the shot. Our Garrett Berger shows us how the system works and where else you might need to check. The city of San Antonio says 30,000 have already signed up for text alerts on new vaccine appointments. And opting into this text alert system will not sign you up for a vaccine or add you to a wait list. But right now, alerts are only tied to the University Health, WellMed, and Alamo Dome mass vaccination sites. Not included at this point are HEB or CVS, which both tell KSAT they're receiving a lot more doses this week available to Texans across the state. So starting today, we've received about over 58,000 vaccines, additionally to the ones that we've received already. Both told KSAT they're getting the doses through a federal program, which may explain why they don't appear to be on the weekly allocation list the state puts out either. To snag their open slots, you have to keep an eye on their websites. I would recommend to check it daily to see if any appointments open up and, and how far advanced that we're able to schedule these appointments. Elsewhere on the vaccine front, the mayor has said if they don't get more vaccine allocations through the state soon, they'll have to shut down the Alamo Dome site once they finish second doses. Additionally, a third stream of vaccines could be around the corner, with approval for the Johnson & Johnson version, which requires a single dose, expected to be approved. Though its reported level of effectiveness is lower than its two-dose predecessors from Pfizer and Moderna, a local expert says it's still good to go. And again, uh, you get access to one um, any one of these platforms, I, I would take it right off the bat. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Texas lawmakers today getting their chance to grill some of the people bearing the blame for last week's deadly power outages. Committees in both the Texas House and Senate heard testimony from energy leaders today, including Bill Magnus, president and CEO of ERCOT, the operator of the state's electric grid. Magnus said the decision to force utility providers to shed load, as they call it, likely saved the state from a blackout that would still be going on today. Energy leaders said their plants are built for the summer and even extreme weather events like hurricanes, but are not currently equipped to handle sub-freezing temperatures. Lawmakers complained warnings that went out about the storm were not dire enough. But not everyone was critical of ERCOT's response when energy demand surged past energy supply. And we came out with a horrible week, but we didn't go black. And I just I think it's important to have that context here. Governor Greg Abbott has called reforming ERCOT an emergency item during this legislative session. Five of ERCOT's 15 board members, all of whom live out of state, formally resigned yesterday. And new at six, though, former attorney Mark Benavidez is serving an 80 year prison term for trading his legal services for sex. His case is still under review by the district attorney's office. Paul Venema with how the DA's conviction integrity unit operates and why the Benavides case merits attention. It's been almost three years since former attorney Mark Benavides was convicted on six counts of human trafficking and sentenced to 80 years in prison. According to testimony during his trial, he traded his legal services for sex from at least six clients and would make video recordings of the intimate encounters. We are looking into not just those incidents that were recorded, not just the um, the videos that he made and the, the documentation that he made, but anyone else who might be um, might have been affected. Howard heads the district attorney's conviction integrity unit. They're not looking at the Benavides conviction, but rather the viability of cases in which Benavides represented the women. What this division does is it grades our paper to make sure that these convictions have integrity. The unit examines cases through requests submitted to their office by the public. On the district attorney's website, we have a case intake summary form that they can fill out and they can submit to us. Internal referrals are also used. That was the case last fall in which two men were convicted based on the flawed testimony of a confidential informant. That's a case that came to us through an internal re referral, through a prosecutor doing the right thing and bringing us information and saying, you know, I, this doesn't feel right. The Conviction Integrity Unit is staffed by Howard and two other prosecutors and the paralegal. We're going to do the right thing even when no one is looking. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News.
The San Antonio police arresting a suspect they say shot and killed a man who confronted him as he was breaking into cars a couple of months ago. 50 year old Oscar Martinez has been charged with murder back in December on back on December 19th. Police were called to the 15,800 block of Chase Hill Boulevard in response to a shooting. At the time it happened, investigators say 38 year old Joseph Ocasio was able to tell them what happened. He would later die at the hospital. Police identified the suspect after reviewing officers dash cam footage recorded at the scene. Officers say the video showed Martinez getting rid of a brown bag with a gun inside. More than a year into the pandemic and scientists around the world are still learning new information about how COVID-19 affects the body. Right here at home, UTSA researchers have uncovered evidence that the virus that causes COVID-19 could enter the human brain. Tiffany Huerta spoke with a lead researcher about their discovery and the technology used to uncover this. A UTSA research team wanted to know if the virus that causes COVID-19 could enter the brain. Jenny Shea, a professor in the Department of Biology, led the research. She says in a the lab they took human stem cells and created brain organoids or tiny brains. Organoids are really small, three-dimensional brain-like tissue grown in a petri dish. And they resemble the developing human brain. Shea says they collaborated with scientists from the Texas Biomedical Institute who are growing the live virus. We brought our organoids over to Texas Biomed and we infected them with very, very small amounts of SARS-CoV-2. We found that there was infection. The virus was entering the organoids. The organoids have different types of cells. They discovered it was affecting the glial cells. Shea says these cells act as a barrier to the brain to protect against viruses and other pathogens. The organoids they studied resembled a baby's brain during its second or third trimester of development. I am suggesting, based on our work, is that we pay close attention to the babies that are being born for mothers who are infected with COVID-19. And we continue to watch for them. We continue to monitor the signs of their brain function. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the trans guide camera at 35 at Thousand Oaks, and it's the southbound lanes. I believe that we're seeing that are coming at us that are very slow going at this hour. Actually, a lot of traffic out and about today. Not sure exactly what that's all about, but you can see I 35 at Thousand Oaks very heavy, especially in the southbound lanes. And if you look off in the distance, you see some emergency lights. Don't know that that's affecting the traffic, but certainly can't be helping. New at six, give what you can and take what you need. Those are the first words you'll see on the free Little Pantry essay Instagram page. But it's not so little anymore as more people need help and more people are looking to help. Photojournalist Robert Samaron shows us how the efforts of these volunteers are helping throughout our community. <laughs> She looked up little pantries and they popped up. I heard about it through social media. So uh, I recently became a part of a larger network of community pantries. Community is all we got. So this is walking distance for a lot of people. Folks have been slowly learning about it and have been giving donations. So one of the most recent donations we got was two briskets. We put a request out on Instagram for the community to see if um, anybody could cook them. And she's all like, hey, Chela, I have these briskets. Do you know what to do with them? And I said, sure, let's make brisket sandwiches. And so Maricela and her parents volunteered to cook the meat. We cooked them all night long. Chopped it up this morning, bought it over here. And then we decided to give it for free. I was all like, let's just make a post about it. Let people know that, you know, they want to donate to the pantry, they can. If they just need to come pick up a sandwich, they can. Anytime anybody makes any donation, it's very much this feeling of um, the community will take care of each other. Yeah, take care of everybody. Thank you so much. Honestly, I think this is a great thing for people to do. I mean, we just need to be there for each other. That's what Sanato's about. Sanato's about community. And everybody puts in a little here, a little there, and it makes something magical. Isn't that awesome? It is. All social media. Neighbors looking out for neighbors. 60 degrees out there today and uh, gray 
has been the predominant color. Lots of gray. A lot of gray around San Antonio and a good chunk of South Texas. Some locations actually had sunshine and their temperatures spiked quite a bit, especially compared to uh, Bear County. Today, we had a high temperature of 66, technically speaking. That happened at midnight. Then the temperature fell thereafter, and we're in the upper 50s right now. Upper 50s in San Antonio, that is, 58 degrees. Meanwhile, 70 in Carrizo Springs, 74 in Catula, and 88 in Laredo. There's a boundary, right? south of San Antonio, right across our area, but just south of San Antonio. We're on the cooler and cloudy side of that boundary. In turn, you can get up to Canyon Lake 54, Bernie 54, Comfort at 57, and Bandera now at 59. Through the evening, temperatures falling through the 50s. We'll have some dampness, not a whole lot of real good soaking rain, but some scattered light showers, some drizzle. That's going to last through the first part of your Friday, and then by Friday afternoon, squeezing in a little bit of sunshine with a high near 60, but overall, all gray really the dominant color in the sky the next couple of days. We'll talk about the weekend, some warmer weather and a better chance of rain coming up. Just a few seconds away now from the daily briefing here for the latest COVID-19 information in our city. The numbers have been heading in the right direction. Let's go live to City Hall. Dr. Junda Wu, our Bear County Public Health Authority, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 404 new cases of COVID-19. The cumulative total is 194,736. We're waiting for about seven days of data where we know all the data is complete before we report to you a new seven-day rolling average. So look for that early next week. We do have four new deaths to report. They ranged in age from their 30s to their 90s. Please do keep their friends and families in your prayers. As we have tried to note every week or every night, uh, each one of these numbers is a life uh, well lived and a loved one lost. So please keep again their families in your prayers. There are 494 patients in local hospitals tonight with COVID-19. That continues a downward trend. There were 60 uh, new admissions in the last 24 hours. And in the ICU, we have 194 patients and 111 on ventilators. A reminder, we have established a vaccine availability text alert system to keep our community informed about the release of more COVID-19 vaccines. Residents who wish to receive updates about COVID-19 vaccination availability can now sign up to receive text alerts by texting vaccine to 55000 or vacuna to 55000. As more providers and pharmacies are allocated at vaccines from the Texas Department of State Health Services, the city wanted to create a tool that would alert the public when COVID-19 vaccines are appointments are available. By, by signing up, you'll receive a text message notifying you of when locations have appointments available. Opting into this text alert system, as a reminder, does not sign you up or, uh, to an appointment or add you on a wait list. This is an additional method to inform you the, the moment that we have new appointments available. Since announcing this alert option yesterday, I'd like to note that over 34,000 people have subscribed. I want to thank um, also we had some incredible vaccine um, activity going on today. I want to thank our Metro Health team and San Antonio Fire Department who are working just incredibly hard. They administered today 3,510 vaccines a single day uh, at the Alamo Dome, 505 per hour. Just an outstanding job from those folks who have been working incredibly hard for more than a year now. So good job, everyone. That's proof that we are ready to deliver more doses if we get them. So again, we're calling on our state and federal leaders to do just that. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great, yeah, thank you, Mayor. And, and obviously kudos, I join in that um, uh, commendation of our folks who are working the, the vaccination sites. Uh, certainly uh, we were asking for more, but I think we're also showing that we can step up and, and actually deliver those to our, our residents. Uh, a couple quick notes. Um, I know that there are folks that still have reached out uh, to many of our offices with respect to uh, bottled water. The water distribution sites for bottled water are still ongoing. Um, I know the, the city has uh, several dozen set up. Uh, the county has now um, about 10 uh, so sites set up for bottled water. Um, and, and those will be going on at least through the rest of the week. Today, the county sites, over 3,800 cases of bottled water were uh, picked up by residents in our community. Um, so that brings now over 20,000 bottled uh, water cases that have been picked up by our community. Um, 
on the water note, I will mention that I know uh, the county has approved, and I'm sure the judge mentioned, about a $5 million relief program to those who are still lacking running water, who need uh, relief with respect to some plumbing um, repairs. That, uh, I know we're still in conversations, as you know, Mayor, with the city and SALS about doing a joint program to provide that relief, whether it be through reimbursement for those repairs or uh, direct contracting. So we'll keep you posted on that, but just know that we are continuing to work on that. Um, and, and then I just wanted to quickly acknowledge uh, uh, some philanthropic efforts by our community. I know the mayor and the judge have called on our, our business community, the private sector, to step up and help. Um, I know USAA made a big announcement today about a statewide uh, effort and donation of 350000 um, and uh, Siebert William Shank, which is a, a foundation headed up by Henry Cisneros here locally, about 100000 to those efforts. Um, and those efforts will continue. You know, we know there's plenty of need, and we're going to continue to need uh, folks uh, to step up and uh, step up to the plate and help us with our community's needs in this time. Lastly, I'll mention, Mayor, I did talk to George Hernandez over at University Health today. Um, a little bit more uh, hope on the horizon. Um, nothing set yet, but I know that uh, the federal government had reached out with respect to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is uh, hopefully going to be pending um, FDA approval uh, soon. So it was main, mainly a point of inquiry if University Health would be interested in, 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 in orders. Nothing set yet, but there at least, I think, uh, more hope on the horizon for additional vaccines, and that'll certainly help our entire community. So that's, uh, again, another uh, bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Commissioner. And as a reminder, if you need help recovering from the impacts of last week's storms, we have set up an emergency resource call center. You can reach it by calling 311 or by, excuse me, call 311, select option 5, or 210-207-6000 to connect with a call taker. Uh, for assistance online, residents can also go to strongertogether.sanantonio.gov. The ERCC is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. As the commissioner mentioned, All right, wrapping up the daily briefing there, the mayor again saying on the vaccine front, they can give them if they actually get them, emphasizing that plea again to the state to deliver more vaccines to the city of San Antonio. We reported earlier, they said if they don't get more, they could be shutting down the Alamo Dome uh, after those second dose appointments are cleared, the ones already scheduled. So uh, he said today, more than 3,500 vaccines given out at the Alamo Dome, more than 500 an hour, and reminding people of that text alert system. Again, not something that signs you up for an appointment or puts you on a wait list, but text 55, a vaccine rather, to the number 55,000 to get those updates on when it's available. Yeah, and just the fact that more than 34,000 people have already signed up for those alerts in just about 24 hours since it was an announced shows that there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people that want to get this vaccine. Uh, uh, the numbers continue to trend in the right direction. Uh, 404 new cases, though, they're not giving out the seven day average because there wasn't a lot of testing that was done last week. So they want to make sure that that's accurate Four new deaths reported. Uh, and Commissioner Justin Rodriguez reminding people that there are still people out there who are picking up bottled water. They have somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 distribution sites so far, people that are still without water in our community. Let's turn to the weather out there right now. 59 degrees today. I think it was a little cooler than some people were expecting compared to how it started, Adam. Yeah, that's right. Temperatures fell off during the day today. Even at midnight, it was well into the 60s, and then now we're down into the 50s because of that cool front that moved into town. Let's take a look at the temperatures across the state. This really tells you what's going on. Most of the state, 40s and 50s, that includes us in San Antonio at 58, Alpine 51. Look at Laredo, 88 degrees. Corpus Christi, Victoria, Houston in the lower 70s. They're on the warm side of that boundary that moved in. It's the same cold front or boundary that moved in yesterday at this time. Moved pushed a little southward overnight, then decided to stall out. Tonight it's going to make a little more progress southward, and it's really just going to drop dew points for the rest of us. I know dew points are down here in San Antonio, but you're still feeling the mugg mugginess south of town. Temperature wise, wide ranging. A combination of the boundary and cloud cover on the cool side of it with temperatures in the 50s and some cases 60s. Hondo, for example, at 66. But then you get into the sunshine on the warmer side of it, temperatures in the 70s and 80s there. Laredo, the exception at 88 degrees. They were even 90 earlier. 
Our visibility has dropped a little bit over the past hour here in San Antonio, down to six miles now. New Braunfels at two miles, Kerrville seven miles. We're expecting more of that drizzly dampness to develop through the evening and night tonight. Combine that with some scattered areas of light rain and overall just a damp night and damp start to your Friday. Future cast showing low clouds, midnight, some areas of light hit or miss showers. I don't expect the areas of rain to really amount to a whole lot, but it's better than nothing. We could use the moisture and I think it all comes to an end around midday tomorrow when we actually see a little bit of sunshine. 48 in the morning, right near 60 for the high temperature north wind at 5 to 10 into the weekend. Back up to the 70 degree mark morning dampness all weekend long. You'll notice humidity and then cooler early next week. Best shot of rain is Monday. I don't mind the gray at all with those temperatures after last week. Yeah. Yes, please. Very nice. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. We'll be right back. Anywhere, everywhere. We'll, we'll play anybody anywhere. It's, it's been forever, so we, we're itching to get back on the field. Josh Jackson and his Incarnate Word football teammates are ready to face McNeese State in big board sports. But first, for the fourth straight season, the Cole Boys basketball team has advanced to the third round. The Cougars kicked off uh, beat Lytle last night, I should say 85-56. Junior Trey Blackmore led the way with 24 points, including that vicious dunk in the second quarter. After back-to-back -back state tournament runs, Cole has established themselves as one of the best programs in the area. And this year, even without, without events, Iwachukwu, who transferred to an Indian Indiana school, they're playing loose and confident. We don't feel pressure. We don't feel pressure at all. Um, we just, we all know that our role gets bigger. Our role, we got to do more uh, as individuals and as a team. Play our game and just don't do anything that's out of our comfort zone, you know? Uh, we just got to stick together as a team and as long as we play together and play as hard as we possibly can and play the best defense we can, I think it'll be a great year for us. Cole will face Blanco in the regional quarterfinals on Saturday at 6. In Class 5A, the Bernie Champion boys put on a clinic behind the arc in their 79-36 area round victory versus Harlan last night. The Chargers hit 17 three-pointers and scored 50 points in the first half. The win marked Champion's 27th straight victory. They haven't lost a game since their season opener against Warren November 13th. They've been rolling because they love sharing the ball. One of us on, all of us feel it, so then everybody starts shooting, and it doesn't matter if we miss because we all lift each other up. So we always count ourselves as a shooting team, and we always uh, push ourselves and push each other. Uh, we're a family out here, so we all, we all work, we all love each other, we all, uh, we all push ourselves. Champion will next face either Sam Houston or Leander Glenn, and those two teams play tonight at 7. One a week ago today, Clemens senior quarterback Max DiDomenico tweeted he's going to Army to continue his athletic and academic career. Max had already signed with Tyler Junior College, but their head coach told Max if a better opportunity comes up to go for it, and he did. Max says he was bummed out a bit and doesn't understand why he and his good friend Jordan Battles didn't get more love from D1 programs. We have all these stats, we, we play against each other, like we play big time football, but we just don't get the looks. And you know, it was, I think he was kind of in the same boat as me, just not so much depressed, but just kind of like, why? Yeah. Questioning each other. So I'm going in with a little chip on my shoulder. You know, I'm, I'm, I think that I have to prove myself, but uh, I'm real thankful. Honestly, I'm real thankful, real excited. Congrats to Max and Seguin ISD athletic director and football head coach Travis Bush is leaving the Matadors for New Braunfels Canyon and lead the Cougars football program. Bush joined Seguin in 2016 and did a tremendous job for that program, school and community. Man, I, I think it'll be real once we get on the bus, once we get on the bus tomorrow, once we know that we're finally in transit en route to another stadium to finally take, a, take the game field and play another opponent. I think that's what it's going to get real for me. The Incarnate Word Cardinals will board four buses tomorrow and leave at noon for Lake Charles, Louisiana, where they'll face McNeese State Saturday at noon. Incarnate Word hasn't played a football game since November of 2019. McNeese has won no this season and ranked 19th in the stats FCS top 25, so they are ready to go, those Cardinals. It yeah, seems like they're fired up. Oh, man. Fingers crossed they get to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A with Dr. Ruth Berggren up next. It's Thursday. That means we are 
privilege to be joined by Dr. Ruth Berggren from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease specialist. Dr. Berggren, thank you for joining us. As always, I want to start with the talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It could get emergency use approval as early as tomorrow. What does this mean? I mean, does it mean that the time frame is shorter for when we could all get immunized? Is it a game changer? I mean, how are you viewing uh, this Johnson & Johnson vaccine? It's really important development. It's a it's going to accelerate getting people vaccinated where it's a game changer is really going to be in places where people don't have the capacity to store vaccines in the ultra cold minus 80 minus 90 freezers because this one can stay in the refrigerator for months at a time. So for those places let's say rural communities or other countries where that simply isn't available it is indeed a game changer there. The other big advance is that this vaccine only requires a single dose. And so you don't have the hassle of scheduling that second dose or the worry about coming back and having that second dose give you some kind of reaction to it. So many more people will be able to get vaccinated because of this. So it's truly an advance. When we were first hearing about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, we spent some time explaining what an mRNA vaccine was and how that triggers your body's response. So what's different about the Johnson & Johnson version? Okay, so the mRNA vaccine was a message um, for our cells uh, put into a little fatty envelope, a little ball of fat that then gets into the cell and it goes straight to our uh, protein-making machinery inside of a cell. This one is has got a di different delivery system. And instead of it being mRNA, it's actually DNA. It's DNA from the coronavirus, only encoding the spike protein. And that DNA is put inside of a modified other kind of virus called an adenovirus. That adenovirus delivers the uh, particle, the DNA of the spike protein that goes to the spike protein into your cell, then that DNA has to get made into RNA in your cell and, and then it goes. So it's kind of um, a step or two upstream of the mRNA vaccine, but it's a different delivery system. And where it's helpful is that the DNA inside the adenovirus is much more stable, it's more hardy, it's, it's harder to destroy than the, the fragile mRNA inside the, the lipid particle. I hope that was helpful. Maybe I can show it with the diagram next time. There you go. I, like, I think it was very helpful. Is, what's the next vaccine that's coming down the pipe? I mean, I know AstraZeneca was uh, approved in Europe, uh, specifically in the UK. Is that something that's gonna be the next one that's gonna come to the United States or is there other developments out there? Well, um, there, there's another one also called made by Novavax, which is a different model um, where you have a protein itself. You're not delivering mRNA, you're not delivering DNA, you're delivering a protein together with an adjuvant, which is a, a chemical that wakes your immune system up. Uh, we have recently completed enrolling people in a trial for that, and uh, we're expecting to hear more news about that vaccine and perhaps an EUA request in the spring. We got a viewer a question specifically focused on reaction to the vaccine that I thought was really interesting. This person asks, does a stronger reaction mean your system is developing a more robust immunity than someone who does not experience any side effects from the vaccine? We don't really have a way to measure that. I've been telling people to feel happy when they have a strong reaction because their immune system is working. Um, but that doesn't mean that people who have a more mild reaction um, are not making an immune response. Here's what we know. We know that the older you are, especially people over 55, the less likely you are to have a big reaction to vaccine number two. Some people notice fairly minimal arm pain and um, fatigue um, that are older, but in no case have we seen a reduced eff efficacy of the of the vaccine for those people who don't respond. So it's it it's there's, it's highly variable from person to person, uh, but people who don't res don't have a big reaction shouldn't be scared that their vaccine's not working somehow. 
We've also, doctor, been getting questions about what people should do if they get sick in between getting a first and second dose, not necessarily with COVID, but just get sick with anything if they get a cold or something like that. So this person in particular said that they came down with a case of shingles in between the first and second dose. How long do they have to wait to get the COVID vaccination? So the real issue is don't go for your vaccine, either your first or your second vaccine, if you are ill. If you have a fever, don't go, all right? But shingles, as you know, starts with little itchy blisters and then they eventually get crusted over. That is caused by reactivation of the chicken pox virus. If somebody with shingles came into direct contact with someone who had never before experienced chicken pox, it is possible that that person could give, through the shingles, give that person chicken pox so we tell people if they have shingles to keep it covered under their clothing or under a loose bandage um, until it's completely scabbed over. There is no contraindication to getting your second COVID vaccine if you have shingles. Just please don't come for your vaccine if you're sick, if you have a fever, or for instance, if the shingles is on your arm where you're gonna get vaccinated. Um, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Dr. Ruth Berger, and I always appreciate your time with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Have a great night. Glad to be with you. We'll be right back. When the weather gets gloomy and cold, not many things are better than a bowl of chili, which makes today perfect for National Chili Day, honoring one of America's favorite winter dishes. It dates back to the days of settling the frontier, but chili really took off here in Texas, partly through hundreds of family-run chili joints. Yeah, chili officially became the state dish of Texas in 1977. That's right. Chili. Chili, chili. <laughs> There are a lot of ways to eat chili besides just filling a bowl with it. Chili dogs, Frito pies, rice, noodles, just to name a few. National Chili Day, not founded in Texas. A restaurant owner in Virginia did it back in 2006. And I will admit that looks pretty good right now. Somewhere along the way, the debate over beans or no beans in the chili was born. Yeah. I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Don't, don't care, you just like chili? Yeah, I just like chili. Yeah, I'm kind of. Chili, chili? <laughs> Carry on. Chili dog, yum. There you go. There you go. All right, that's my favorite commercial favorite that's, that's commercial. on air by far. Uh, if only you at home could see me in the studio when that commercial airs. It's a fun one. Anyway, all right, let's talk about our weather here. It is a little chilly compared to what we had yesterday. 58 degrees will slide down gradually through the 50s this evening. Midnight will be at 54. And notice how those rain chances pick up a little bit. Mainly just drizzle and sprinkles and that dampness. But definitely a few showers embedded within it could give you a few hundredths of an inch of rain. We'll talk more about some warmer weather for the weekend before our next cold front, our next best chance of rain in this week's winter. Let's not forget. See you in a minute. It was dreary outside today, but Adam Kasky is certainly not because Thermometer Thursday is back. It's been a couple weeks yeah. with all the weather that we've had around here. It does, and what I have for you today actually relates to the weather that we had, particularly last week, and a first for one of my thermometers that are out here in South Texas. All right, let's take a look at our weather headlines here, and there's a big temperature difference across South Texas right now. More dampness on the way already starting, and we're going to have that off and on damp through the weekend, but the best chance of real rain and more numerous and widespread showers that comes on Monday. So we have to wait, have a little patience for the real rain. It's going to look like it could start pouring at any moment when you have these low clouds, but the real rain I think will hold off until Monday. So let's take a look at our time lapse here starting at five o'clock and you'll notice the clouds actually drop a little bit in the sky as we go through this. The ceilings fall a little bit. We start to see that dampness commence. Visibility six miles right now. A little bit of drizzle out there. Air temperature of 58, dew point of 55. They're very close to each other, which means we have a high relative humidity and high moisture content relative to this uh, air temperature. Look at the visibilities though. Bernie, five miles. New Braunfels, 1.75. Even Randolph measuring six miles along with the airport, International Airport in San Antonio, six mile visibility. So there will be some visibility issues periodically if you're hitting the roads tonight all the way through the morning commute tomorrow. Mainly just that drizzly, misty, 
dampness, the, the nuisance type that's hard to find the proper setting on your windshield wipers. I think we can all relate to that. Right now, temperatures mostly in the 50s to near 60. Port SA at 60, Rio Medina 62, Canyon Lake 54, along with Bernie 55 in Bull Verde and Comfort, you're 56. But look down to the south. Catula 74, Laredo 88, even Kennedy, Victoria, Corpus Christi, Houston in the low 70s. Big temperature difference out there right now because of this stalled frontal boundary. Moved in yesterday, decided to just park itself south of Highway 90 uh, earlier today, and it will continue its trek southward a little bit more overnight tonight. So the drier, less muggy air on the cooler side of it, including San Antonio, will spill southward a little bit later on tonight. But I mean, you're in the thick of the humidity. Kennedy, Corpus Christi, Victoria along the Coastal Bend and even down near Laredo, very noticeable mugginess that's in the air. Tomorrow, not all that muggy, but by this weekend, you'll especially notice the humidity, particularly on Sunday. Sunday, it's going to be very notable. So if you like to go out for a long jog, you work out outdoors, you'll notice the mugginess this weekend and especially on Sunday, the real spring-like humidity in the air and temperatures a little bit warmer. A lot of cloud cover across the state right now. A little bit of shower activity to show for it, especially closer to Dallas and north of our area. There still is a dip in the upper level flow that's near Albuquerque, and that's helping to generate some lift, not really affecting us all that much, but we will see a different disturbance drop in as we get into Monday, and that's going to help us out along with the cold front in terms of generating that better chance of showers. So there's that disturbance getting closer to us on Monday. So look at our rain chances here. Friday through the weekend, 20 to 30%, mainly just some dampness with a few sprinkles mixed in periodically. By Monday, I think we're looking at a shot at some actual real areas of rain and more numerous and more widespread than what we've experienced thus far. So pretty good coverage and better coverage as we get into Monday. Tomorrow, just some morning sprinkles, 48 degrees at 7 a.m. and then right near 60 for the afternoon high. Of course, that's sunshine dependent. Those of you that get a few extra hours of sunshine, You'll be warmer into the 60s, a north wind at 5 to 10. And looking ahead, you see those temperatures back up near 70 over the weekend with highs or the temperatures near 70 with the high humidity. And then next week, we're going to drop off again because of a Sunday night cold front. We'll be down near 60, so it's going to look and feel a lot like what we have out there today to kickstart next week. I do my very best to engineer my thermometers to South Texas climate. That would make sense. The coldest we've ever been is zero in San Antonio. The warmest we've ever been is 111. I try to stay within that range here in San Antonio, but wow. Ms. Milford's thermometer, it bottomed out under the scale last week. <laughs> so Cindy, I know she, she emailed me. I think we need a few more degrees on there. You're right, we do. In this particular one, the bottom of the scale is at 10 and she dropped to about nine degrees. And so it's just an instance that goes to show our big temperature range here in South Texas. And that's something you have to account for and engineer for. And that's why sometimes I throw away thermometers that are too high of resolution because then their range is less. So say I could measure down to every half a degree. Well, if I did that on a six inch thermometer, it won't be able to go all the way down to zero and all the way up to 111. So that's something I have to consider when I do this. So this week's winner, Sharon Retzlaff of New Braunfels. Yours goes from zero all the way up to 118. So Sharon, right. I think we've covered the bases just <laughs> fine for you. And so we've hit the bottom now. We'll yes. hit the top maybe in the summer. Well, we'll see. But yeah. that, that's what I that's what I try to prepare for. I, I think last week was just out of range in general. <laughs> yeah. Just Let's just forget about it. Speaking. Yeah. I agree. In case you missed <laughs> it, coming up next. News around America now. Best Buy making some changes to its workforce, responding to a higher demand in online shopping. 
The electronics chain laid off 5,000 workers this month, mostly full-time employees. The plan now is to add 2,000 part-time employees. Best Buy expects to close more stores on top of the 40 closed in the last couple of years. With more people shopping online, stores that do stay open will likely be redesigned, reducing the size of sales floors and expanding the space dedicated to shipping orders. Disney's California Adventure Park will reopen on March 18th for the first time in nearly a year. The experience will be called the Touch of Disney. Capacity will be limited. For $75, visitors will be able to roam the park, see Disney characters, and use an unlimited photo pass. But the rides will still be off limits. The company says masks are a must, and guests will undergo temperature checks before they walk in. Tickets go on sale March 4th. All right, tomorrow, back up near 60 for the high. Some sprinkles, especially in the morning, then into the weekend. Noticeable humidity and mugginess. High temperatures back to 70 degrees. Gray is going to be a dominant color in the sky. We'll have some afternoon sun here and there, but get used to gray. Monday's our best shot of some real rain. Not these sprinkles, not just drizzle, but some more real meaningful showers. A little breezy and cooler as well. Substantial. It's mm -hmm. a good way to put it. Big word, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Adam, and thanks for watching. Saw my daily thesaurus. <laughs> Is that your today. screensaver today? Substantial.